This is going to be an absolutely fascinating evening. Uh, this conversation is uh, about uh, very timely, and uh, I uh, can assure you that uh, if you've never uh, thought about blockchain or Bitcoin before, uh, if you really dig into it, it's going to change the way that you look at your bank, the way that you look at your money, the way that you look at the world. Uh, uh, in a little bit, we are going to have a panel discussion. I'm going to be joined by Paul Vigne uh, from the Wall Street Journal and the author of uh, two engrossing books on this topic. Uh, also, Lewis Cohen, who I've known for uh, more than 20 years now. Um, so uh, a fellow uh, refugee from the traditional financial sector uh, who uh, got the blockchain bug. And uh, last but certainly uh, not least, Yuzo Kano, who is the CEO of Bitflyer. Um, I would say that Japan has now become uh, probably uh, the most important country uh, right now um, in Bitcoin. And uh, Bitflyer uh, is definitely at the center of the action. Uh, before we have the panel, though, uh, Mr. Kano is going to give a brief uh, presentation. He's going to give everyone an introduction to blockchain technology. He's going to talk about the situation in Japan, and he's going to talk about uh, his company's international expansion. So without further ado, please welcome Yuzo Kano. Hello, um, I'm Yuzo Kano, CEO of Bitflyer. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your very precious time. Um, and uh, I'm very honored to speak here. Um, I'm going to speak in the 20 minutes about our company and the, uh, our product blockchain and exchange. But first of all, I actually need to actually mention a little bit about CoinCheck. Um, the, it's, uh, it's an incident. Uh, it just happened here, uh, in Japan last week. Unfortunately, they actually got hacked. Uh, 58 billion yen worth of NEM. It's, uh, it's a one of the virtual currencies. And then CoinCheck um, announced they're going to actually compensate the part of their uh, the client's assets. Uh, still think things are actually going on. Uh, we are not really very sure the timing they're going to uh, compensate the, the, the loss. Um, but hopefully, actually, the company will uh, make it up. And unfortunately, the regulators actually has a lot of concerns about the uh, securities on the cryptocurrencies at this moment. Um, I'm thinking that the probably uh, they're going to strengthen the uh, regulations, uh, especially for the uh, um, uh, securities and the, uh, uh, the management thing. So now, um, it's a good news. Uh, <laughs> Um, I'm going to explain about the B-Flyer. So if you look at the uh, logo, do you know what it is? There's actually five blocks and one circle. I actually founded the company in 2014. Um, I thought that the both blockchain and the virtual currency is going to be very popular. So I actually made the logo uh, by using the PowerPoint. <laughs> this is so simple. So these five blocks describe the blockchain, and the one center circle describe the Bitcoin over the virtual currencies. So Bitfly is very unique. We actually provide the uh, two major business services, the one is blockchain and the virtual currency. So usually, the startup are actually doing one thing and focusing on one things because there's actually less resources. But I'm actually um, trying to do the both at the same time and global expansion. So we got the license in Japan, US, and EU, and we are the only one operator having the, uh, all the licenses globally. Um, this is our mission. The making the world simpler through blockchain. There are two layers, uh, the blockchain layer and the virtual currencies layer. Virtual currencies, like, such as actually Bitcoin, is a one use case of the the blockchain. Since the, the, the security of the blockchain is very actually the firm and you can trust, you can call the number written in the blockchain a Bitcoin or the currency. 
in 2010 or 2009, people didn't trust that because it's just a number on the blockchain. But maybe actually from the 2013, uh, people actually trusted, oh my gosh, this is, is this a money? And the value just generated and the people trading higher and higher uh, the Bitcoin, that this is actually how the value on the Bitcoin was generated a couple of years ago. But actually it's a digital data, so you cannot see, you cannot touch, but it's a just a number written on the, uh, the blockchain. We do both actually blockchain and virtual currencies, but as a broad and wide of the actually uh, category, we think both are uh, belonging to the blockchain. Um, Komiyama-san is my co-founder. Uh, both actually Komiyama and myself used to work for Goldman Sachs. I joined Goldman Sachs as an engineer and uh, become a trader after that. So I studied a little bit about the uh, uh, both uh, finance and the technology. This is FinTech. Uh, Komiyama-san is a CDO, used to work for Goldman and the Konami and the Sony. Uh, he's an engineer. It's, uh, if you look at the uh, top, below the title, in the corner of the uh, bread shop in Tokyo, we didn't have an office at the beginning. Now we have actually 130 employees globally, but I started in the bakery and it's growing little by little. It's a very typical startup, but uh, it's rapidly actually growing. This is our value. Usually it's called like a MVV model. So you state mission, uh, vision, and value. Our value is pen, uh, passion, execution, and numbers. We don't have anything. At the beginning, no money, no people, no employees, no trust, no clients, no revenue. But we only have passion to make it. So passion is the uh, source of energy and it actually drives the business a lot. Uh, it's really difficult to actually like the beat or um, let's say make the new actual product because our competitor is not just the startups, but the big banks. So we need the passion to drive the business very quickly. And execution is very important. A lot of people think, a lot of people actually think this is easy to make. Um, okay, I, I got an idea. Uh, I can make it make it work, but it's really difficult to make it. Uh, it's easy to say, but difficult to make. So we value the execution to make it down. Um, numbers is very important for us. Um, since I'm a uh, uh, sort of actually scientist, I usually think anything very quantitatively. So rather than actually, okay, okay this is good or this is bad. Um, I would say, how good, how bad, and why? Because uh, without actually numbers, it's kind of difficult to compare uh, which is good or which is better and the best. So usually uh, in marketing, hiring, product, uh, anything should be actually quanti uh, quantitative. Um, I'm gonna explain the both actually services in the blockchain and exchange. So now this is a blockchain. We made a propriety blockchain named Miyabi. This is very Japanese name. The reason why I give the Japanese name is just because we want to actually start with um, very Japanese culture and going global, like US and Europe. Um, we got the uh, uh, patent uh, it's a global patent about the uh, uh, private blockchain. There are actually two major categories in the blockchain, public blockchain and the private blockchain. Bitcoin, Ethereum, those actually considered as public blockchain. So anybody can join as a node or the users to actually transact the, uh, uh, let's say, or virtual currency, um, send, send the virtual currency on the blockchain or execute a smart contract. Anybody can join. This is actually called a public blockchain. Miyabi is considered a private blockchain. Only the limited users can join. Um, with that, uh, we got the finality. This is very actually important function as a blockchain that finality 
is you can determine the data immediately. Unfortunately, the public blockchain like uh, Bitcoin, you have to wait at least for one hour because based on the uh, consensus algorithm named the uh, uh, proof of work, it's really difficult to tell the data is fixed or not in a second. That's actually a disadvantage of the, uh, uh, the public blockchain. This is a little bit uh, complicated, but uh, we categorize uh, blockchain as a database, a part of database, because you can write and you can read. So we think the blockchain is a part of the database having several uh, unique functions. Um, if you look at the top, it's, it's wrong spell. It's RDBMS, Rela Relational Database Management System. This is a very common database, like Oracle, uh, MySQL, or um, Microsoft SQL servers. Uh, there are actually several types of database. I think the more than 90% of the databases belongs to RDBMS. If you, ha if you add the distributed, so you have the uh, several uh, nodes. This is considered actually several uh, distributed database, like uh, Apache Cassandra. And you add immutability. Immutability is a function. You cannot delete the data at all, like Bitcoin. You cannot overwrite. You cannot update. So that's the reason why people actually trust the data inside of the blockchain. It's immutable. Um, BFT. It's very unique function that there are several nodes, and some of the nodes actually goes down. Still, you can reach out to the right data because nodes are talking each other and decide which data is correct or not. So this is a function that, although there are actually several computers slash nodes went down, uh, you can come up with the uh, uh, right data and the eco whole ecosystem actually continue running. Um, single point of failure uh, is if the one actually nodes go down, if the whole system goes down, this is not good because the whole system actually belonging to one node, then this is not a blockchain, I think. So try to avoid the single point of failure. Otherwise, I mean, it's, it doesn't have the availability um, system actually could go down easily. And the finality, as I explained, uh, we need actually finality uh, to fix the data in a few seconds. Otherwise, the uh, no financial institutions wants to actually use the blockchain as a database to uh, write down uh, any transactions, not only the virtual currency transactions, but the uh, stock movement, buy, sell, uh, money wire, uh, or uh, trade finance. MIAB is the very fast blockchain. The, the problem of the Bitcoin's blockchain is very slow. It only transacted seven transactions per second. It's very slow. That's the reason why the fee on the Bitcoin had been increasing. A few years ago, we only paid three cents to transact international payment through the uh, Bitcoin's blockchain, but it hit actually 30 bucks Thirty dollars. I don't want to pay actually thirty dollars because banking is cheaper. This is not new technology. If you pay the thirty dollars per transaction, I don't want to send, let's say, two dollars to my friends by paying the uh, extra thirty dollars. <laughs> so the the this is actually the biggest problem with the Bitcoin's blockchain. B the capacity of the block is too small. It's set to one megabyte. Uh, Miyabi actually transacts 2,000 to 4,000 transactions per second. I think this is good enough to transact the most of our financial uh, use cases. But still, this is much more slower than the usual database. Usually, Oracle can transact more than 100,000 transactions per second. So blockchain has a lot of actually good functions, immutability, BFT. Uh, so it's secured and a huge availability, but it's very slow because the nodes are located remotely 
and they're talking each other to come up with the uh, right uh, answer all the time. The, we got nominated as a, a, a partner vendors by Japanese Bankers Association. Japanese banking infra infrastructure is managed by the JBA. This is under JBA, by the way. The, they actually built the system called like a Zengin net, and then the banks actually joining that network. And if you initiate a transaction of the fiat currency, uh, it goes through the uh, uh, JBA Zengin net. The, we are very honored to get, to get nominated, as well as Fujitsu, Hitachi, and Entity Data. They are actually gigantic um, system integrators, and we are the only the startups got nominated. Moving to the exchange, um, we had actually first uh, virtual currencies exchanges got the all the licenses among the uh, three continents, uh, US, Japan and Luxembourg, uh, you can actually operate to the old EUs by getting the license in the Luxembourg. Uh, the trade volume is a uh, highlight. The, in 2017, it's got a, a lot of increase in the trading volume. And before actually 2016, um, I mean, nobody actually cares about the cryptos, but we actually think this is the first official year of the start date of the uh, uh, virtual currencies. Um, we are actually ranked number one in the world. This is including a leverage trading in the uh, cryptos. We provide 15 times leverage uh, to the Bitcoin. And then usually the people compare the exchange service by the volume because more liquidity is easy to trade for the users. Uh, we can actually provide a cross-border trading, meaning that the, the U.S. guys can trade to the Japanese guys in the same board or the book. That actually brings some more liquidity from Japan to U.S. or vice versa, or maybe to the U Europe. So my opinion here is, in the crypto, comparing the traditional financial uh, market, it's much, much smaller. It's very thin very small liquidity. So increasing the liquidity slash actually trading volumes is very important for the, uh, all the people. The reason why it's volatile is because there's actually less liquidity than the traditional market. So more users coming in and more actually reports, uh, showed, uh, reports actually uh, uh, issued, then I think the volatility will be settled down the, yeah, I mean, world's most regulated virtual currencies exchange as uh, we got three licenses. Uh, we, we are very patient. Uh, although there's a lot of actually operators without the license, uh, we didn't operate at all because compliance is very important, we think. We got the license in Japan uh, by FSA, financial services agencies. Uh, we got the 42 states license, um, including the bit license in New York, uh, which is very difficult to get here. The, the last month, or this month, the got licensed by CSSF it's, uh, in Europe uh, regulatory. So compliance is a, a competitive advantage for us. We don't have any period of time uh, running the uh, business illegally. So what's happening in China? Uh, seems like they're trying to ban the cryptos. Uh, that's the reason why uh, all the major exchanges uh, are coming to Japan recently. <laughs> uh, that's unfortunate. Um, uh, South Korea, initially there was actually um, the news that the government, the government actually banned the virtual currencies, but they switched their mind. Uh, there are actually some pressures by the, the users that shouldn't. Um, so, road to regression is Japan. Uh, Japan is uh, the first actually country um, that issued the specific law for the virtual currencies. Um, 
that is actually called the Virtual Currencies Act. It's enacted in April. Uh, there are actually 16 exchanges got the license so far. Uh, we are one of them. Unfortunately, Coin, uh, CoinCheck doesn't have the license yet. Uh, maybe that's the reason why uh, they are not fully aware of the security uh, or uh, the management. Uh, regression plus protection equals certainty. The, it's really important to protect the consumers first. So Japanese Virtual Currencies Act uh, forces us to uh, distinguish the client's assets and the firm's asset all the time. So we need to rebalance the asset, not only just cryptos, but the uh, fiat currencies, to the uh, uh, dedicated accounts. This is really important. Uh, OK, this is actually the, uh, all the slides. Um, I'd like to highlight that the, I mean, again, we actually do both have the, uh, uh, the blockchain and the cryptos. And I still believe that uh, talking to the regulators and the, uh, setting up the uh, right regulation is a key uh, to save this ecosystem. Otherwise, I mean, it goes underground or maybe actually regulators set uh, inappropriate actually roles, uh, meaning usually it doesn't fit to the crypto world, it doesn't have that concept, or maybe actually try to apply the uh, uh, usual traditional financial role, which is uh, too strict. So uh, I'm still uh, talking to the regulators to uh, what is actually right regulations, uh, not only just the virtual currencies, but maybe the uh, ICOs, um, so hopefully, uh, I mean, currently the situations in the virtual currency is not that great. Uh, people are kind of uh, very pessimistic, but hopefully uh, people can recover the trust uh, and then the fingers crossing for the uh, new futures. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you. So I want to pick up uh, the conversation, uh, actually, uh, right where you left off at the presentation when we're talking about regulation. Uh, Yuzo, you're now in three continents. Um, so you've dealt with a lot of different regulators across the globe. Can you talk about the differences that you see in the attitudes mm -hmm. from the regulators in the different countries and in the different states here in the U.S.? What kind of questions they ask, like what their disposition seems to be to this technology? Sure. Um, basically, all the regulators are concerned about AML and CFT. And uh, for those who are unfamiliar, that stands for anti-money laundering and uh, counter Know your terrorism. customer. Uh, yes, and uh, yeah, know your customer. Yeah, so uh, basic rule is the same. So you have to know your clients uh, by, uh, I mean, approving their IDs, uh, photo IDs. The Japan is kind of advanced because uh, we have the specific actually law, uh, law for the virtual currencies. So uh, Japan has the, uh, as I said, the segregation of the firm's, firm's assets yeah, and the customer's assets. That's, that's required. US is a little bit complicated. They, um, we are actually required to get the MSB uh, and the MTL, money transmitter, and the bit license in the, in the New York. Some actually states doesn't require any license. Um, so it's a little bit uh, uh, like not, not actually uh, have the same role amongst the states. But mainly actually focusing on AMLs. So we need to actually put some um, money uh, for the collateral to the regulators to mm -hmm. protect their consumers. And uh, um, the, some states actually require the uh, capital uh, reserve. Uh, Europe. Uh, mainly actually it's the same, but there are concerns more like uh, receiving the Bitcoin. Um, so we need to track the, uh, the movement of the virtual currencies on the blockchain. Uh, if there's actually suspicious activity from the suspicious account, uh, we need to stop. Um, they usually are not really fully aware of the technology, so it took two years to explain for us to them uh, to them uh, what the new technology is. Interesting. L uh, Lewis, uh, what's, your, what's your perspective on 
uh, the global regulatory uh, attitude towards towards this whole sector? It's it's uh, it's developing, Mark. Uh, regulators. Um, uh, are still trying to figure out what the right way to look at uh, these products is. And there's no single product here. Virtual currencies um, have a certain set of issues. Um, token sales, sometimes known as initial coin offerings, have another set of issues. There are a whole range of ways that blockchain technology can be applied with different jurisdictions and different issues. So right now, regulators are doing a lot of discovery, and in many cases, they are regulating by enforcement. So rather than, in Japan, promulgating new laws which are proactive, in the United States, we see a lot of regulation through enforcement actions. The problem with that is it doesn't give the best guidance to the market because we know what not to do, but it's hard to know where the perimeter is. What is it that we can do? And that presents a challenging environment for people to innovate. And it's, it's sort of ironic that, that you know, regulation is such a big part of the whole conversation now. I mean, Paul, you, you've been covering uh, Bitcoin from the early days, uh, and the early adopters uh, they were not big fans of regulation, is no. that fair to say? Uh, to, to say the least, they were not big fans of regulation. I think a lot of them thought they were simply going to evade regulations forever and, and that they had created some new world that was you know, external from any government influence. And that really lasted about six months to a year. I think pretty quickly people started to realize, and it was really as soon as you started to see this touching the mainstream a little bit, as soon as they started to get outside of that sort of cypherpunk circle and, and the anarchist libertarian circles, and they started touching average people, they realized you're not going to be able to have a technology that has an effect in the quote unquote real world and not have to deal with the regulators and, and the governments of those real worlds. And I think, you know, you can see that in, in, in what Yuzo has done. I mean, like, Frankly, you guys could have done some offshore thing and avoided regulations and, and had nothing to do with anybody and probably made some good money at it, uh, but you didn't want to go that route. I mean, you, you went a completely different route. And I think you saw a lot of people make that decision. You know, do we want to be the, you know, the, the, the pirate radio of the finance world or do we want to actually deal with people and deal with regulators and be proactive and, and, and try to create something that we can have this technology and this product that we all believe in, you talked about the passion, and have that be something that touches people in a normal way. And I think that's where you, you saw that shift over the course of a couple of years, but I think that has pretty much taken hold now. Now, when you talk about the, you know, the average person, the, you know, the, the consumer on the street using uh, cryptocurrency, you, know, you, know, the, the, you have to go back to sort of the basic question, why? Um, and maybe Yuzo, you could start like you know, the, you know, the, the, there's this term in Japan, Mrs. Watanabe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, why, why, why are consumers in uh, in Japan, other countries, using it? Are, like, are they really using it to to buy things? Are are they doing it for speculation? Is it just a way to get rich quick? Is this day trading? Is this gambling? Like, what 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 is the use? What is the real use case? Yeah, the the actually main use case is speculations. They actually buy the coins and they're selling in a second. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a day tra trading, um, or uh, usually they buy the other minor cryptos through the Bitcoin. So they buy the Bitcoin here and wire to the, the exchanges uh, outside of Japan and buy the very cheap coins. Uh, so, and then, I mean, expecting that's gonna be like 10 times or 100 times. Uh, that's actually main usage. We also provide the uh, payments. Uh, we actually made an alliance with a, a very big uh, retail uh, shop, uh, Big Camera, uh, or Yamada Denki. They are selling the uh, computer stuff and wines, alcohol, uh, or Excel City stuff, anything. Uh, so they can, uh, people can use the uh, Bitcoin to buy the things. Do they? Yes. How much, in significant volume? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's increasing. It's increasing, but comparing to the spe speculation, it's a part of the activity. 
maybe to pick up on that and, and perhaps connect the dots a little bit, um, I had a presentation earlier today um, here in New York, and someone uh, asked a sort of pointed question. He said, well, I, I just don't see the point of Bitcoin. We can make payments very easily. And he was just confounded by the whole thing. And I said, well, where do you live? Well, here in the US. I said, well, that's right. And it's a point, Paul, you bring out in your book very well. There isn't a great use case right now in Western countries for payments with Bitcoins. We have very good payment systems. They're cheap and they're efficient, as you mentioned in your remarks. But in many other places, in Afghanistan, where you started your book out, um, we don't have that. And so by purchasing Bitcoin here in the US, what you're effectively doing is taking a view on the adoption of this incredible technology in many places around the world where it is needed. And I think that's a very valid use case. You're not using it necessarily as a store of value here in the US. You're taking an affirmative economic view that over time in countries like Afghanistan and Nigeria in Argentina and Venezuela, there'll be demand for this. And I think that's, a, for me, a very valid way of looking at it. Well, that's, spe that's speculation as well. But what, uh, It is, absolutely. But it's speculation with a thesis, yes. which is that the idea of a decentralized cryptocurrency will be of increasing interest. You want to pick up on that? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think even the irony of this entire discussion and debate about what good is Bitcoin for <laughs> is that four or five years ago, that was a real question. Why should I use Bitcoin at all? Today, they asked that question and then they go ahead and pull out their mobile app from Chase or whatever their bank is, and they pay for something, or they use Apple Pay or Google Pay. You know, the, the idea of digital mobile money in the last five years has become really pretty commonplace. And, and even here in the US, and I am as, actually, despite the fact that I write about Bitcoin, I am the biggest Luddite on the planet. I have cash in my wallet right now, and I will use it before I will ever drag out a credit card. But the idea of mobile money, I think, is really becoming something that people are very familiar with and, and used to now. And Bitcoin fits right into that, but Bitcoin kind of, I, I really almost think that Bitcoin missed the boat on what it could have been four years ago if they didn't get into, and this is a whole rabbit hole, folks, we don't need to go down into it, but you guys know what I'm talking about, the scaling debate. Uh, I think well, th Bitcoin important. took a really kind of a, a big left turn on that, and at a time when they could have been a leading technology, mobile money, and could have really done something uh, cutting edge on that, I think they've fallen behind on that. I think the world is caught up to Bitcoin, actually. And I think it's interesting, in Japan, you now have rules put in around Bitcoin. And when those rules went on, I thought, this is it. Japan is going to be the really big sort of test case for Bitcoin to see if it can work on a daily basis. And I think you alluded to it in your presentation. You, the, the way that the fee structure has now evolved makes it very hard to use Bitcoin for any kind of normal purchases. I, I think Bitcoin has caught a, sort of hamstrung itself in that case. I think there is a great case for mobile money. And I think Bitcoin really could have been leading that, that development. And I think they've kind of fallen apart on that a little bit. But is that, is that really all, all that Bitcoin's about? It's just that, just that front end. I mean, I, I actually do think it is worth briefly touching on the scale. But by the way, when, people, when we talk about the scaling debate, how many people here know, know what Paul is referring to? It's, it's, it's OK to, OK. All right, Paul, uh, <laughs> in, in, in 20 <laughs> seconds, explain the scaling debate. <laughs> oh my god. OK, so Bitcoin is set up to be this self-operating program. It has a lot of different levers to make that work. One of them ends up being uh, this fee that people can put into, you gave me 20 seconds, Mark, geez. Uh, <laughs> The, the, the problem is that Bitcoin is not scaled. It has not grown up. There are only so many payments that can go through the network at per second, and people are offering higher and higher fees to move their, net, their, their payment to the top of the, the front of the line. Fees are going up because the network hasn't been changed, and I'm not doing it well because you gave me 20 seconds. Uh, the problem is, though, that fees have become very expensive. Five years ago, fees were negligent. They didn't even exist, really. Uh, and now it can cost $30 to make a, a single Bitcoin transaction, which makes it very impractical if you're trying to use it for anything small. Uh, actually, it came off recently to 10 cents, so it's a good news. So, so it came down. It, it, it was actually cheap and then hiked right. up to the $30 and then back to 10 cents. I think this is just because there's a lot of uh, people trigger the, uh, uh, the, 
the witness uh, segregated. Se yeah. Segregated witness. Yeah. And uh, don't worry, we won't have to explain segregated witness because that's a whole technical <laughs> technical issue. Yeah. But I do. I mean, I I think the thing about the scaling debate, though, uh, and actually this is where I would push back a little bit against uh, uh, against that observation earlier is that it was all about what is Bitcoin really about, and you had in 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 and please. Uh, tell me if I'm mischaracterizing it, but there, you had these two camps, and one camp was saying, within the Bitcoin community, was saying, we need to scale fast. That you know, we need to make this now, today, a, a viable competitor to PayPal. And you had this other camp, which was, uh, you know, uh, the, the probably more ideological, but very much invested in the project of Bitcoin, saying we have to proceed extremely slowly, extremely conservatively. We cannot do anything that can jeopardize the security of the network, and we cannot do anything that can jeopardize or further centralize the network. And so you had have, you have this one group that was saying, you know, like Paul just said, you know, you know, let's be mobile money right now, and let's scale right now, sooner rather than later. And you had this other group that, that was just sort of saying, we, we have to be gradual about it, and we have to protect what makes Bitcoin special. Is that, is that, a, is that, a, is that a fair uh, yeah. summation of yeah. the debate? I think it's a fair summation, but I think it's also important to understand that inherent in the idea of Bitcoin is the idea that it is operates purely, it's capitalism in its purest state. Everyone is motivated by their economic interest. The people who validate transactions of the network, miners, do so for pecuniary gain. This makes a complex dynamic because there are multiple motivations, and we see that in the scaling debate of different agendas. So some businesses liked the idea of a network that was, you know, had a, these smaller block sizes, fewer transactions, and would, might allow them to build other things on top of that, which they could, you know, be compensated for. So there's no rule set, and people are approaching the whole project very much from whatever is in their economic interest. I think that's very valid, but it's also important to understand there are many different agendas going on and many different layers yes. in understanding what, what, what's going on. Yeah, and I think not to get too far off track, because you made an interesting point. I mean, uh, Bitcoin is a technology that has a lot of different applications, and, and exchanging value is one of them, and I think it's a very good one, but it's not the only one. And the, the larger issue to keep in mind is that idea that what we have now, what you're putting in, in place and what people are experimenting with, is, is really a very new way of, and this is going to sound, it's really funny because um, this is actually very boring. Uh, it's an accounting ledger. It's a new way of, it's a new accounting book is really all it is when you come down to it. It sounds very mysterious and there's a lot of shady character on Bitcoin and we think it's very esoteric. But when you really come down to it, it is just a program that allows you to record transactions in a ledger, which sounds very boring. But actually, the applications for it are, there are so many applications, there are so many things you can do with that, it becomes really fascinating to explore all of that. And, you know, again, the, the, the scaling debate's interesting, but I don't want to get too yeah. far, you know, I don't want to waste all our time on just that. No, but and I started it, so I feel bad. Yeah, no, fair enough, <laughs> fair enough. Um, so may maybe we, we can talk about some of those some of those uh, other other use cases. I mean, you know, Lewis, like, wh why are businesses interested? Businesses, enterprises, interested in in this in this blockchain stuff? Like, what 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 you know, what good does it do, does it do them to have? You know, they have ledgers. They've had ledgers. They've had accounting forever. What 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 does this distributed ledger do for them? How does it add any yeah. value? Let's ask a businessman. Sure. Um, First of all, actually, as I actually explained in the, uh, the presentation, that uh, it's very secure. Uh, so uh, secure, and usually uh, it's available, meaning the system never goes down. For example, like Bitcoin's blockchain was uh, running, uh, has, has been actually running for the last actually uh, nine years without any fail. Uh, the actually nodes got a lot of actually DDoS attack, maybe every single day, but still keep on running. Um, this is high availability, super high availability, and it's secured. The data stored in the block never be rewritten because all the data is actually have the relationship to the previous block. So if you actually rewrite, if the hacker actually rewrite the data, you can detect so easily, and then you can ignore that node and then pick the data from other nodes. So I think the uh, security 
key and the, um, uh, the immutability, uh, those are the key keywords they want to actually use a blockchain. You know, I mean, Bitcoin was created for people transacting on the internet who don't trust each other. Mm -hmm. It is a zero trust environment. Yeah. Um, do corporations not trust each other to the degree that they, that they, they need a solution like this? Well, they're actually different layers, actually. The trusting the corporate mm -hmm. is not actually technology. We're talking about technology layer. Mm -hmm. So although actually maybe the Bank of Japan has a system, it could actually get hacked, right? So I can trust the Bank of Japan because they have a lot of trust. So the credibility on the company itself and the credibility of the system is different. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. I would also add businesses look at this technology for some other reasons. One is simply cost savings. So in the financial sector, Mark, you know very well, um, you, we see multiple ledgers, and you made the point, Paul, that there's just basically a ledger at the end of the day, multiple ledgers all keeping track of the same thing and needing to be constantly reconciled to each other. There's a tremendous amount of work, effort, and cost that, that results in that. There are also capital considerations to make where you have centralized parties, there may be a need to hold capital in multiple places to cover centralized risks, for example, with swaps and derivatives that are not actually necessary if everyone can keep a constant um, unified ledger record and trade in real time, there's no need to hold capital for settlement risk. This is in and of itself a huge uh, potential use case. So saving cost is a starting point. But as I like to say to folks, the passion that you see around Bitcoin isn't really, or blockchain generally, about saving money. There are new businesses that are springing up all over the place that are decentralized, looking at existing businesses. So right now I talk to clients, almost any major business you can think of, somebody's got, well, I've got a decentralized version of, of Uber. I have a decentralized version of Airbnb, a decentralized version of Amazon. And why, and why is decentralized at, important? It's important for a number of reasons. Because there's no central um, common control point, one, it has many of the benefits that, that um, we mentioned here, but also because costs can be much lower. When you have a centralized party, they need to make an equity return. When you think about you know, large businesses like an Amazon, their equity market capitalization is enormous. If you could provide the same services without that you know, central capital, that could be much, much cheaper. And people are always looking to attack incumbents. So there are a lot of use cases around that, attacking incumbent businesses. In the area of insurance as well, people are looking at providing insurance without nearly the, the cost base, peer-to-peer -peer insurance, for example. Fascinating area you can do with blockchain. It, you know, if, there, if there's a, so if you have a, a decentralized Uber, say, hmm. and there's no central authority, there's no Travis Kalanick uh, calling the shots, uh, it's just this completely distributed network. And then an Uber car hits someone on the street. Who do you sue? Well, how you resolve that depends on how the system is set up. But right now, I don't know that you're suing Uber in any event. The reality is that there are things called decentralized autonomous organizations, ways of setting up uh, groups of businesses or people that don't have a central point. Who you sue and how you sue them will be determined by other factors. And you may not need to sue anyone because things resolve themselves in their own system. It gets very complicated, but I, I would certainly say as a lawyer, people are not slowing down because they're worrying about, you know, in a decentralized Uber, for example, you know, who do you sue? Paul, I mean, now that you've written, uh, t you know, two books on this topic, uh, The Age of Cryptocurrency and now The Truth Machine, how do you view this technology over time changing society. 10 years from now, if this blockchain thing really takes off, as like everyone says, uh, like, well, how, are how are our lives gonna change? Thank, thank you for asking me the broadest, biggest question <laughs> you could possibly think yeah. of. Uh, it was only fair I, after I the think, scaling debate, right? Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I think the potential is very large, and that's really why, why I, I write about it. I think this is a very interesting technology. Uh, my, my Interest in this is to tell a good story, to tell an interesting story that I think is going to have an impact on our lives. I'm not an investor. So I, I write about this because I think the answer to your question is that the potential is great. Uh, I, would, I would say two things. One, keep in mind, I think a lot of people always talk about, they try to compare uh, Bitcoin and blockchain to the internet. And they say, well, it's like 1994. We're at the point of mosaic. Or it's 1995. or not. 
I, I think we might actually be in the 80s or the 70s. I think this is very, very early days for this technology. I mean, the internet itself went live in a lab in, I think it was 1969. And it was there in the 70s and nobody knew about it, but scientists were working on it and they built the technology and they spent a long time building the technology. The difference is that Bitcoin went viral and now everybody knows about it. But in terms of its development, I think we are still at a very, very early point. The potential, you talk about the potential. Th think about this. Uh, and when we, we're discussing uh, a ledger, right? We're talking about an accounting book. What does this accounting book allow you to do? Because the program we're talking about distributes that accounting book across a number of linked computers, no one computer of which is the central point. They are all carrying an exact copy of the same ledger. What it allows for is an incredible amount of transparency and clarity into the individual entries in that ledger. And I think a great example of abuse of a ledger in the systems we have now is Lehman Brothers in 2008. And at the end of 2007, Lehman Brothers had a record year. And Lehman Brothers had their best revenue ever and their greatest profit ever. They had a $4 billion profit. Or they had $4 billion in revenue and a $1 billion profit. They had a really great year in 2007. Everything was great. Nine months later, Lehman Brothers was out of business. How could Lehman Brothers be out of business? We all saw the books. The books looked great. Well, the answer was Lehman was not truthfully keeping the books. Lehman was abusing the books. But we didn't know that because we couldn't see into that. This technology would allow you to see into that. Now, obviously, you're a lawyer too, you know, there are so many thickets in that. I mean, no bank wants everybody looking in at their book. There is a lot that needs to be sussed out here. But essentially, the, the potential of this is that you could have an online system that is not controlled by any one party, thus is much less rife to being abused, that allows a tremendous amount of transparency and, uh, like you talked about, immediacy and uh, lower costs and all those great things, but that the idea that you could have a system that cannot be abused in the way that, these, that, that we have abused systems in the past, I think that is the greatest potential. And the ramifications of that could be very, very large on a societal level. You know, th that transparency can be a double-edged sword, though. You know, it, it, uh, particularly when you're talking about public blockchains, when everyone can see what's going on. Usually, maybe you could talk about the two sides of that, what that means uh, in terms of AML compliance and helping, uh, you know, law enforcement uh, track these transactions. But also, like, you know, you know, how do how do your customers feel about about uh, the privacy the privacy questions that raises? Well, it's not really actually linked to your account. So you can, I mean, the coin checks incident is a very good example that you can track where the actually coin goes and then you can detect the wallet, but you don't know who that is. So I think the privacy itself is, um, uh, is protected. So if the actually police wants to arrest somebody, usually you come to the exchange and then you actually find the link between the account and the blockchain. This is how actually the police actually arrest the people. So if you look at the only the blockchain, again, it's, it's impossible to actually detect who's using and who's moving the coins, so. But, the, the, but I mean, there, there, are, there are whole businesses that, uh, there's a, like a cottage industry now of companies that analyze the blockchain. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they, yeah. they work for law enforcement, they work for yeah. the banks, you know, they're, they're tracing things all, all day long. And you know, there are some users who have uh, publicly advertised, mm -hmm. this is my, this is my, uh, this is my Bitcoin address. This, mm -hmm. this, you know, send me some, zap me some Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, that seems like that, that, that's a privacy leak. Is, is yeah, but nice. that's intentional. Actually, you're leaking your information. Don't yeah. do that. <laughs> well, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you, and, and I know that there are like, there are, you know, there are some really interesting solutions in the works to kind of give us the best, best of both worlds there. Um, uh, I mean, you, you talked about passion earlier. Um, you know, what, what is the passion that drives you in terms of like, because it, it, it can't just be to help uh, people, people speculate. I mean, mm -hmm. like, like, like what, what, what do you think is sort of the end game here? Uh, sorry, I didn't understand what, your so, question. So what, what drives your, like when you talk about passion, like, like what kind of a future do you want to build? What, what do you want this to lead to? Well, 
I, I, I want to actually make the world simpler by blockchain. That's our mission. So um, I think the uh, blockchain actually provides a lot of actually better services than the uh, current financial uh, systems, or not just actually financial systems, but any actually government system, etc. I'm a member of the ISO, International Organization of the Standardization, uh, talking about the, uh, uh, the terminology of the blockchain and the uh, uh, DLTs. My personal opinion here is I want to actually talk about the interoperability that is actually function to connect each blockchain talking each other. Even like the uh, uh, Miyavi uh, can talk to the different blockchains such as like Hyperledger. So for example, uh, Miyavi has a system uh, like, uh, for example, uh, account system in Japan. And then the Hyperledger may, might have the, uh, another actually the individual uh, data management. And so the, we, we can do the AML uh, very easily by accessing to the other databases run in the uh, different regions. Or maybe I can uh, use the one blockchain uh, to transact the uh, stocks from Japan to US. Uh, that's actually covered by the different regulators. <laughs> but uh, I think it's possible. For example, like the sending the actually money from Japan to US, it costs how much? It's, it's minimum like uh, $50 and then, and then plus actually extra uh, spread for the uh, Forex. That's, that's too expensive and the system actually remains the same for the last actually 30 years uh, provided by the SWIFT. It's old protocol, old system. But 1970s. Why? Yeah, but why still using the SWIFT? It is just actually transacting the data from one to B, one to, from here to there. <laughs> yeah. One thing, Mark, I, I want to touch on, because we're, we're spending a lot of time here talking about Bitcoin itself or other virtual currencies, and that's a huge part of the story, but the blockchain technology can do a lot of other interesting things. And I'm curious, just again, by a sh quick show of hands, how many people have heard of Ethereum? Is that something right? So, so this was a, a huge step forward, of course, in that it said, well, if you have a blockchain that keeps track of numbers, as mm -hmm. Yuzo, you were very clear, you can keep track of numbers, can be anything, can be computer code. And of course, with Ethereum, you have a blockchain that actually can track and operate computer code in a virtual machine. And to my mind, that's some of the most interesting applications of this technology are where you start to allow code, which we call smart contracts, to operate in this blockchain environment. One of the things I'm particularly fascinated about is people have heard of crypto kitties. <laughs> Let me tell you, this might my, my, my one you buy one? My, <laughs> you can tell yeah, us. My, my, my one tweet I was proud of, I call it crypto kitties the starting gun of the blockchain age. And I stand by that. Because what is a crypto kitty? On the face of it, it's a little novelty, a cartoon cat that actually, if you have, can breed with other little cartoon cats and create more of them, which in theory you could sell if they're rare and unusual. But really, what a crypto kitty is a bit of smart contract code. It's a digital asset. It's a natively digital asset. And what these guys demonstrated is there's a real world market. People who, maybe even me, will part with their real world money to buy a digital asset. And once you start thinking about what that looks like and what these digital assets can do in a marketplace, for example, the opportunities are unfathomably large. Um, so I don't know if you've covered that, I'm sure, in your yeah. column, but I think I, I would pay close attention to it. It's very different from a cryptocurrency. Each asset is unique, and each lives on the blockchain. So very, so, very so different. So they're, they're, they're digital beanie babies? Then? They're digital beanie babies, yes. But again, you, you, if you get distracted by the novelty, yes. you miss the underlying point. Yes, no, We're now true. creating digital assets right. that people are owning, and there are all kinds of people you know, iterating on that you know, um, in different ways. You know, the, the other thing that I think is that we should talk about a little bit is, is, is the uh, phenomenon of ICOs. Um, you know, uh, uh, it stands for initial coin offering, which sounds a lot like initial public offering, um, which was probably a very bad choice of nomenclature on the part of people who invented that. Pa Paul, uh, just uh, you know, expl explain the phenomenon, and uh, is this just um, uh, a way around the securities laws, or is there is there something more important uh, developing here? Uh, yeah, so what happened, uh, what you need, one thing you should understand about Bitcoin is that it is open source software. It is a program that anybody can take and, and copy and make their own version of it. And that's what has happened many, many times over. That's Ethereum was basically uh, a guy, Vitalik Buterin, took the ideas and the concepts behind Bitcoin, wrote his own version of it and created it. 
And this happened times and times and times and times. And a couple of years ago, people started to realize that you could build a token and attach it to a thing. Not just have Bitcoin sitting out there as its own currency, but if you had a project and you wanted to raise some money, you could sell the token. And maybe the token would have a use on your new platform that you're building. And a couple of people did this, and it worked. Ethereum itself did it. Yep. When they wanted to, to start up, they wanted to fund the project, so they created their own token, sold it. I think they made about $8 million when they did it. Tiny. Tiny in comparison. Mid last year, for you know as many reasons as you can come up with, this thing started to take off. You started to see more and more people, projects, creating their own tokens. Uh, it became very easy. Actually, the, the code, the lines of code you needed to do this on Ethereum's blockchain itself became standardized. And suddenly you had dozens and dozens of these new ICOs, projects that didn't exist a year ago, six months ago, two weeks ago, didn't exist now, hadn't launched yet. We're coming up and creating these tokens and selling them. And because Bitcoin was rising so much, Ethereum was rising so much, you had a hot market and here comes these new assets and the whole thing was a forest fire and it took off. And by the end of last year, ICOs alone had raised $4 billion, which is an almost astounding amount of money when you really think about it, uh, far outweighing what seed stage firms were raising in traditional capital markets. And that's what these all were. Virtually every single one of these was a seed stage co project. Companies, not even companies really, just a bunch of dudes Ideas. who wrote a white paper, didn't have a project, didn't have a product launched. Uh, but the thing became a real investing frenzy and it really kind of helped feed that Bitcoin Ethereum rally in the second half of the year. That's where we stand right now. Uh, can, well, well, can ICOs list on BitFlyer? Um, uh, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not at this moment. Actually, I'm receiving an email every single day, at least actually five. About get, I was going to say, you yeah. get more than one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I get more than one. Yeah. You get more than one. So um, I'm um, rejecting any ICOs at this moment uh, because the, uh, the rules in the ICOs is very vague uh, in Japan uh, and any actually uh, legislation. So yeah. I want to actually make it very clear. Uh, if there's actually certain rules and they're following the, uh, the rules, then that's fine. But at this moment, it's kind of vague. Uh, what is token? Is it securities or virtual currencies or what? If I think it's, you just call it, okay, my token is very safe and then <laughs> this is decentralized and then this is not illegal. So you should list it <laughs> always. Right. Special, special, uh, special message for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is not scam. Yeah, right, right. right. <laughs> so. And sadly, a lot of them are scams. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, would you say more than 50%? I, I don't know. I, I would say this. I think most of them are not going to go anywhere. Just honestly, there are a lot of projects, you know, it, and, and that's not, you know, I, I would think most of them are not going to go, whether or not they're scams or not. Uh, it's very hard to, you know, and you've done it, congratulations to you, but like, it's very hard to build a company and build a product and build yeah. a platform that people want to use. So whether or not they're scams or not, I think they are extremely speculative investments for people. Now, a lot of More the guys so than Bitcoin. What? More so than Bitcoin. Just as much as Bitcoin. Yeah. I think Bitcoin's a speculative investment as yeah. well. Yeah. You know? um, so, yeah, they're, they're highly speculative. You, you touched on the, the fact that there's no rules around them. That, that's a big deal, too. Um, but that's about to change thing, very soon, I, th I would think. It's changing every day, every hour. Yeah. Uh, you have a situation in this, in this country, the SEC is you know, trying to lay down the law and, and try to put rules around these things. Uh, there was a big one that they shut down today, and, and they are piecemeal trying to get their arms around this thing. And eventually, I think it will happen where you will have regu regulations around them, and you will have some investor protections put in. But right now, you don't have those at all. I mean, maybe let me explain a little bit as a lawyer why it is a bit complicated. And you asked, "What is a token?" And I like to like hold up a blank piece of paper and ask you, "What is this?" 
Well, it's whatever you write on it, right? If you write, I promise to pay you, it's a debt. If I write, this is a share in my company, it's an equity security. If I write, you can use my software, it's a license. It's whatever you write on it. A token, likewise, has no meaning. It's an empty vessel. So when we ask, what are tokens? Tokens are whatever you put into them. If Microsoft, for example, uh, wanted to do the latest edition of Office 360, its online consumer suite, and say the way you buy that, you don't go to Best Buy and get a box with a little number, you buy a token. And when you stake the token, you can use their online suite, and you can, when you're done with it, you sell it to someone else, you know, do whatever you want. There's a little exchange for Microsoft online um, tokens. Well, how much do you want to pay for it? Hey, that was a really good addition. Now there's no more of them. I like that. Get one. I'll pay you a little more than, than you paid. Is that token a security? I would say absolutely it is not. It's a license to use software. It's a very complex question. And the reason regulators are moving slowly is they recognize this, that you can't make a single rule and say, oh, all tokens are this, because they're simply not. Right. So it's very complex. You know, the way I like to think about it, um, uh, so I grew up in New York in the 80s, and before we had the MetroCard, uh, we had subway tokens. They were literal coins that you would buy that you would have to put in the machine before you got on the train. And, um, you know, people would buy like a week's worth at a time or whatever. Uh, so these ICO tokens, it's kind of like that, except you're buying the tokens before the subway system's been built. Um, now, which probably, I mean, I, and I could, see, I could see arguments for both sides of this. I mean, you know, maybe that's just, just like opening up access to capital and making good on the promise of the Jobs Act that uh, Obama signed. But on the other hand, you, you, you're creating receivables before you even have a product. Uh, you know, it's very complicated. Um, courts in the United States have spoken to this, and some of you may have heard of a very famous Supreme Court case uh, called SEC versus W.J. Howey, which involved a Florida-based company that was selling interest in orange groves and claimed it was a real estate deal. For various reasons, the Supreme Court determined it wasn't, that they were selling securities, and they created a, a four-point test of determining what is a security. That test has actually stood the test of time, and it continues to be relevant to analyzing tokens. But these are very subtle questions. We don't have time to go into that in detail, but there's no clear 20 answer. 20 seconds. Explain it. No, sorry. I got, you got 20 seconds for, for scaling. I get five seconds <laughs> for the how he says investment of money in a common enterprise with a reasonable expectation of profit, primarily from the efforts of others. Not bad. There Not we bad. Go. Um, so those four factors are, are what apply, but how you apply them in any given right. case, of course, is complex, and people hire lawyers to kind of work their way through them. Well, and it's interesting. I mean, you, you talked about Microsoft, you talked about Subway System. And you look at those things, and you know, I, I remember tokens too. I grew up around mm -hmm. here, and I mean, if it was what was it, fifty cents or th whatever yeah. the token was, you were never. If it was thirty-five cents, you were never. And I don't, I don't remember what it was. It was thirty years ago. Sorry. Uh, if it was thirty-five cents, you weren't going to pay seventy cents for it. You're going to pay thirty-five cents because you knew mm -hmm. what it was. You knew what the utility value of that token was. Yeah. With these ICOs, it is completely different. People are using them completely as speculative assets, and you see, pr you know, the, these tokens going up multiples in value and trading on exchanges that are not as responsible as, as some others on this stage. And they are, right now, they are nothing but speculative assets. Yeah, I mean, you know, the other... Many the, of them. The other... The, not the, all of them. The, most. Most. Most, if not all. You know, all. The, the other imperfect analogy would be when you buy tickets for a concert and you scalp them. You know, but there's a lot of scalping right now of, uh, yeah. of, 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 of tickets for... A scalping, that, by the way, illegal. Yes, which a scalping of tickets for a concert that may or may not ever happen. Um, right. So I, I want to um, uh, buyer beware. So I want to open it up for uh, questions from the audience. We have two mic runners in the room. Uh, so uh, just raise your hand, and a, a mic runner will come uh, and bring you the microphone. Uh, uh, I, I do request, uh, please um, uh, ask a question. Do not give a soliloquy and um, uh, speak uh, directly into the mic. So uh, first question uh, over here. Hi. Um, it's on. It's on. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Daiki Nakajima. I'm actually a member of Vertcoin. Um, just a quick question to Kano-san. Uh, we spoke a little bit about decentralization in the US, obviously from a US use case, but I just wanted to get a little bit more on how you think about decentralization on Japan's market side? Sure. Uh, 
Well, decentralize the keyword for sure. Uh, I mean, I still believe that there are actually some a huge change in the society uh, by adopting a decentralized system. So not, I mean, again, same, not rely on the uh, centralized system. It could be actually bottleneck of the, of the uh, all the transactions. Uh, so for example, if you actually make the uh, decentralized uh, the stock trading, um, you don't actually have to pay the broker's fee. Uh, that's actually called uh, DEX, D-E-X, decentralized exchange. Um, so currently actually they are trading in cryptos, but if you actually make the token, uh, that's a symbol of the uh, stocks, then you could actually trade your stocks in the DEX. So, I mean, I, I think I think it's, it's really actually a uh, drastic uh, technology for the next actually 10 years. Does, uh, if DEX te uh, decentralized exchange catches on, what does that mean for your business? Um, well, I think if the, a lot of people actually use the DEX, maybe that destroy our businesses because we are uh, kind of actually doing the KYC mm -hmm. and then we are very compliant and then it's, it's costy. Mm -hmm. uh, and if the people actually just trading the uh, uh, cryptos on the DEX, uh, you can pass through the uh, traditional virtual currencies exchange. But we're going to be the, uh, the, the, the door to the uh, fiat currencies and the cryptocurrencies because mm -hmm. you can't really actually trade the, uh, the fiat on the DEX. Um, so I don't know. It's, uh, maybe we can survive, but uh, it's difficult to tell. But you've got the enterprise product anyway, so you're, you're hedged. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next question. Sir. Oh. Uh, hi, my name is Peter Burgess, uh, True Value Metrics. Uh, could you talk a, a little bit about the difference between a money transaction and the use of blockchain technology as a means of financing? Who wants to take that? You want me to, you're, look, you're looking at me. I, I, I think you know, perhaps part of what you're referring to is in the U.S. and in many jurisdictions, we have regulations that apply to money transmitter businesses. So where uh, a, a business is involved in the transfer of money from one location or one person to another, because that activity can um, facilitate illegal activities, terrorist activities, etc. There are significant regulations around any money transmitter business. There are a wide variety of entities in the U.S., like banks and broker dealers, who do that all the time, but they're subject to separate regulation. Here in the U.S., we have specific regulations. If you're not otherwise regulated by anyone else, like a bank or a broker dealer or many other things, you're simply a bodega, for example, on the corner that'll take in money here and send money to another place. For example, in Islamic finance, there's a technique, the name of which is Shrai. Uh, 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 no, where, where you know money can be sent just by the oh, hawala. 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 Thank you very much. And that would be a money transmitter business. All of those things are regulated here in the United States, as well as in many other countries, I suspect in Japan uh, too. In a blockchain, you're not transmitting, generally speaking, transmitting money. You're using, for example, tokens in the example of Ethereum to uh, you know, do something. So an example that Paul was talking about earlier, uh, be, be functional, is Filecoin raised a lot of, of money. The idea was there's a tremendous amount of unused online file storage, this token can get you access to that. It rewards the people who provide the storage, and it's used to pay for that by others. There's no money transmitter business in that. That's just paying for a good or service. Did that answer the question? Was that? OK. Mm -hmm. Do you want? <laughs> money out of nowhere uh, because the banking system was going to fall apart. I mean, it was measured at uh, uh, multiple trillions of dollars. 
And one wonders whether or not the blockchain idea can't in some way be mobilized so that it can finance the needs of society in this uh, world of ours and the needs to remediate the environment, which are bigger deals than, frankly, the banking system falling apart 10 years ago. So can we use the blockchain idea as the foundation for a completely new thinking about how finance can operate? Uh, that is a really big question. I'd say the theoretical answer is yes. <laughs> The, the, the realistic answer is I think we're going to need to see. I mean, what happened in 2008 with the, with the banking collapse was the banking sector collapsed, and it was a big part of the economy. And people decided, well, do we want to let these guys go down in flames and, and deal with that, or do we want to do something to prop them up? And they chose to prop them up, uh, for better or for worse. Right now, you have a situation where Bitcoin was invented with this whole idea behind it is, you know, this is sound money. This is something that is backed by, you said, it, you know, proof of work. Uh, the idea is that we're going to create a set number of coins. They will be distributed over time. And this, this is it. This is, that's why they like to call it digital gold. Uh, but keep in mind, like I said, these are very, very early days. I think a really interesting test case was what happened with Ethereum two summers ago. Was that yes. two summers ago? The yes. Dow? The Dow. So the idea is that you have this blockchain, this immutable ledger that can never be changed, never be altered. That's why it's sound money. Ethereum, a couple of years ago, a bunch of guys got together and they came up with this experiment. They called it the DAO, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization. The idea was to have a smart contract-based company that would have no CEO, no board of directors, no management. They would write the instructions into the code and this autonomous organization would take off and run. They launched it, raised about $150 million. It, it went, it raised a lot more money than they thought. They thought they were just going to launch yep. it and have this as an experiment, but it kind of went viral. Everyone threw money into it. They had all this money. One person, and we still don't know who the person is, one really smart person uh, looked at the code, realized the loopholes in it, and set up their own little wallet within the DAO to funnel all the money into their own wallet. And before the guys realized it, 50 million of it was gone. A third of it was gone. They had a decision to make. Are we going to have this be the immutable ledger that can never be changed and everyone's $50 million is gone and sorry because somebody was clever enough to figure out the loophole in the code? Or are we going to reverse those transactions and make that money essentially disappear? They chose to reverse the transactions. So... There are theoretical things that are supposed to happen, but in the real world, when things look really ugly, sometimes people make decisions that are not theoretical but are real. So I think this technology has great potential theoretically, but when you run up against real considerations like the banking system collapsed, like, oh, we just lost $50 million, human emotion kicks in. So again, very early days, a lot of potential, but there are going to be many, many stories like that before this thing is, is completely built out, I think. I agree. All right. Uh, we're, we should uh, take some more questions. This gentleman here. Hi. Um, Katayama with Potent and Partners. Can you speak about the electricity consumption um, and I, uh, whether that will be a b bottleneck going forward? I think it consumes yeah, 0 0.15 percent of the total elect electricity uh, consuming in the world. Um, by the Bitcoin. So a lot of people actually think uh, it's, it's a waste of electricity. <laughs> when, when, when people say that to you, how do you respond? Um, well, actually, there's one um, certain answer is that if you're actually directly counting the uh, amount of the electricity consumed in the uh, Bitcoin's blockchain, maybe it's, uh, it's, it's 0.15 percent. But uh, for the banking system, also actually consume the electricity because there's a lot of people working and they're maintaining the system. So if you're counting on the uh, whole the, the banking system, it may actually consume more than the 0.15%. Uh, so it's, if it's narrowed down, maybe it's, it's, it looks bad, but it's, if it's a wide uh, economy, um, I think it's uh, still okay. Mm. 
uh, over here. Hi, my name is George Friedlander. Um, two relate, one, I guess, two parts of one question. Implications of cryptocurrencies for cur traditional currency relationships and for central bank policy as this stuff explodes in the amount of that's out there, what happens to central banks and how they behave and how they respond? That's a great one, Paul. Yeah. Me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think the idea that central banks are feeling threatened by this technology is completely overblown, if anyone's even talking about that anymore. Uh, but central banks are intrigued by this. I think probably at this point, virtually every central bank on the planet has addressed it in one form or fashion. Uh, I, I can see a world where eventually digital money, and look, in some countries it's much further along already, but I, I think you can see a world where digital money is going to be a very real part of our daily lives and the central banks are going to be part of that. Uh, I think what you are going to see is the central banks experiment and adopt this technology to suit their own uses as they see fit. Or if they don't see fit to use it, they'll let it exist on its own. Uh, governments are not going to collapse and central banks are not going to collapse. They're not going to go away. You're just going to see all of this kind of develop and it's either going to dovetail or it's not. There'll be some friction or there won't. I don't think you're going to have central banks banning Bitcoin and outlawing digital currencies and it's all going to be driven underground. I think you're going to see a very natural, organic progression of all of this with some bumps along the way. Yeah, I'm just, just going to just pick up very quickly on the idea of central bank digital currency because it's a fascinating uh, uh, idea. And again, almost every major central bank is, has stated publicly that they've looked at it closely. But it's important to recall we already have digital dollars in this country. When you think about the Fed, um, and it's it's the banks that clear there. There are no stacks right. of dollars that are moved around. The only thing the Fed has is a ledger very similar to the Bitcoin ledger. It just happens in the Bank of America, you know, 784 billion. But it's just a ledger. So it really is just a, a step forward. And I think we will see in due course more and more banks. Why can't Apple, for example, who has probably more cash than almost all other banks, you know, except for a handful, they clear at the Fed too. The um, uh, Bank of England has looked at something called real-time gross settlement, and it's sort of the idea of allowing more entities to clear at the Fed and right. effectively have access to digital pound sterling, or in our case, digital dollars. So it's a great question, and there's a lot more to come in that area. And, and in sure. that scenario, they're dis disintermediating banks more than they're disintermediating yes. central banks. Right, the central bank's still there, but that's right. Profound potential repercussions for commercial banks, yes. And, and uh, You get a lot of issues. Yeah, I mean, it's a very, very, I mean, we can't answer. There's a million yeah, issues, yes, but, yeah, yes, but it would there, seem there are, that yeah. one of the concerns of central banks is not control of amount of currency, but control over the amount of velocity. Yes, I mean, there are complex economic, macroeconomic yeah. questions, yes. Before we take the next question, uh, the Bank of Japan, what's what's been their disposition towards this? Well, uh, actually, they are not really uh, worried about the virtual currencies because uh, a lot of actually Japanese people loves cash. Mm -hmm. um, actually, it's different. The crypto is not really used for the, uh, the fiat currency. The fiat currency has a lot of functions to uh, control the economy and the st stabilization of the uh, currency between the uh, Japanese or US dollars or whatever. But crypto doesn't have the uh, function to control the uh, money flow. So I think th they are different. So crypto could be actually used for the payments. And the Bank of Japan are uh, interested in the uh, uh, ledger technology uh, to keep their uh, the money transaction. So, I mean, that's that's very different. So, yeah. Over here. Uh, my name is uh, Rudy Bertel, and I have a question for Kano-san. Uh, by what metrics? Do your investors value the company, and what's the biggest biggest risk to your business model? Uh, our actual share questions. shareholders are uh, mainly the the mega banks, uh, venture capitals. 
uh, I got the money from the, the fund named the uh, Digital Currency Group uh, in New York. Uh, the CEO is named Barry Silbert. He has a lot of actually uh, investment into the uh, crypto exchange and also own the uh, uh, crypto itself. The biggest risk is obviously like a hacking. So we need to actually make sure our security is uh, to protect the consumers. So you can't really actually uh, say, okay, I'm done for the security today. You have to continue the uh, looking for the uh, new technology to protect our uh, systems. On this side. Hey, Mike Bajell with Block Tower Capital. Um, just a question. Uh, what are the implications for a reputable firm organization like Mitsubishi to be issuing a stable coin in yen? And how do you think that, um, how do you think that impacts central bank thoughts within Japan? The, um, the Mitsubishi uh, announced that they're gonna issue the uh, MUFG coin uh, you used to actually consider that the, uh, the part of actually fiat currency uh, is considered as a bank's balance, so they can issue the liability um, backed by the uh, uh, yen asset. That's a function of the bank. So, okay, this is just the uh, uh, bank deposit. I'm not worried too much about the uh, MSG coin, but recently there's another news that the MSG coin uh, could be actually considered virtual currencies meaning that that has the fluctuation to the JPY and the people can trade the, the MFG coin as a cryptocurrencies. That's gonna be very useful because you can move, you can issue the crypt and you can move uh, as an intermediate currency to convert JPY, MFG, and that you can use it to the payments. Um, again, I mean, although actually it's used for the uh, payments uh, more often, I shouldn't, I, I don't think that should impact to the uh, current financial system issued by the uh, Bank of Japan. I think we have time for at least one more question. Uh, let's uh, try one in the back there. Hi, Katsuo Takada. I have a question to uh, Mr. Kano. <laughs> I have a lot of questions. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> because you are the founder. Um, my question is, I understand that the efficiency and the mutable system in the blockchain, but my personal fear with Bitcoin is a speculative fluctuation. Uh, is it possible to make it fixed value with Bitcoin? Fix, so fix that ju just use a transactional uh, efficiency uh, by using a Bitcoin and eliminate fluctuation of value in the oh. Bitcoin, is that possible? Yes, uh, yes, it's technically possible. Uh, you need a special license like a money transmitter. For example, uh, if you want to move the uh, JPY and to USD, you actually convert JPY to the Bitcoin and immediately you flip back to the USD. This is how we actually trans, uh, transport the uh, Japanese yen to USD. So there's actually fluctuation of the Bitcoin you can eliminate. Uh, but you need, you need the uh, money transmitter license in both U.S. and the Japan to do that. So in that model, you're using you're just using the Bitcoin as like a, a freight car. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Okay. Interesting. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, this gentleman over here. Bring this gentleman a microphone. Um, I think we. Do you want to just shout it out? Yeah, just shout He's it that out. That guy's got a good voice. Yeah. Sure. Uh, you yeah. Here. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Uh, I I like Lightning Network. Um, this is actually called the uh, second layer technology that you transact uh, the transaction out of the uh, Bitcoin's blockchain uh, be because this is too slow, as I said. So you use the Lightning Network and then transaction Bitcoin or, or any cryptos and then write the some um, the footprint to the uh, the main chain. So I, I like it. I'm uh, not very sure about the uh, Bitcoin Cash because there's a lot of actually uh, controversial discussion between the uh, Bitcoin Core and the Cash, but I think this is one of the uh, alternatives because it's, uh, it has a huge block size and uh, it's, it's, uh, you can actually wire it in the main chain. 
And uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. I'm afraid we have to, it's time to wrap it up. Uh, uh, please join us uh, for a reception on the first floor. Thank you very much for the panelists. I could go on all night. Yeah. But uh, thank you. And thank you. Mm -hmm.